Hey everyone, welcome to this conversation I had with Peter Rollins. He is the author of numerous books, namely How Not to Speak of God, The Idolatry of God, and many other books. He's a philosopher, theologian, but perhaps most importantly, he is a community builder. He is an individual trying to build what he calls a, a community of contradiction or, or com a community around a and shared lack. And for me, I find that to be a very important, um, not only existential, but even ethical political project. Um, I was joking around with him that uh, this, for me, meeting him was kind of like meeting a Jay-Z or a Kanye before Kanye turned into an SMI. Okay, bad joke, leaving that aside, I have been following his work for a, a long time and he has deeply influenced my thinking. Um, and, and in fact, even helped me uh, through certain struggles I've had with the idea of uh, God and Christianity. Um, and I couldn't believe when he was so uh, charitable with his time to get on the podcast and have this conversation with me. Although, uh, a quick housekeeping note, this was supposed to be uh, a three-way between Trayden Leno um, uh, and himself and then me moderating it where Traden would come from the more conservative, traditional, uh, orthodox Christian perspective, and Peter would come from the uh, radical theology perspective and kind of articulate this project he is, he is working on of the, the God of contradictions and the community of, of lack. But unfortunately, Traden couldn't make it for this conversation, but rest assured, I will do my best to try and organize a dialogue between Peter and Trey, because I think they both are extremely deep and profound thinkers and they're doing important work uh, by uh, matching or, or that's not a good word by combining let's say theology and philosophy not in a superficial hand wavy kind of way but rather taking these ideas seriously and dealing with the inherent contradictions antagonisms uh, and, and working through them and i think that's important work uh, saying all that, without further ado, uh, apologies for the prolonged introduction. Uh, here's my conversation with Peter Rollins. Well, uh, the first question for me is, uh, Peter, I I guess, how would you uh, uh, articulate or frame God for, for an atheist and then at the same time frame God for, let's say, a believer, be it a, a Catholic, a Protestant, uh, or anyone really who believes in God. Okay, that's good. By the way, when you sent me your questions, I was like, these are all great questions. Every question you ask is like huge. We could spend a month dissecting, which I love. So uh, <laughs> it made me feel like I'm in very safe hands talking to you. You obviously have a very big grasp of this stuff. And I just found out before we started recording, this is not your academic specialty. You're, you're in computer that's science. That's correct. Computer yeah, my background's in computer science, but uh, as I kind of joked, well, probably, probably partially joked that I get my Jewish zones from, you know, reading theology and philosophy and then struggling with these, these concepts. Yeah. Well, you obviously take to it very well. So, um, <laughs> I get yeah. it. so the question of God, which is kind of like, yeah, you can't really get a bigger question than that. I mean, the, I, as you know, I run a, a yearly course called Atheism for Lent. And the reason why I call it Atheism for Lent is it's a play on people giving stuff up for Lent, obviously, and to go, you know, instead of giving up chocolates or marzipan or television or whatever, you know, what about giving up God? And at first it sounds very counterintuitive, but then you kind of realize, oh, Lent is the run up to Easter and Easter Sunday is where God experiences atheism, like the loss of God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that course, I try to introduce people who are theists and atheists to the idea that God is should be of interest to, to all parties. And that these two positions that if you watch YouTube, you would think are diametrically opposed, right? Every YouTube debate about God basically has a theist, uh, an apologist against someone who's anti and they fight it out. And that actually hides the truth that theism and atheism have been in a dance for thousands of years. And not just a dance, but a love affair. Um, that there is traditional theism that says God exists and there's traditional atheism that says God does not exist. 
And then there's a form of mysticism that says every time we speak of God, we have to be an atheist because every speech we say is wrong. So suddenly atheism is introduced into theism. And then um, this, this dance continues in interesting ways right the way through the philosophical tradition. So I suppose the first thing I'd want to say about framing God in terms of atheism and theism is to try to uh, complicate the picture in a really interesting and enjoyable way and say that that the word God, let's say, like, let's take the word God as a signifier for that which cannot be spoken. I mean, that's a very traditional notion of God. You see it in Anselm, there were, he, Anselm defines God in the proslogion as that than which none greater can be conceived. And what he kind of says in the proslogion is God is not something you can conceive. God is greater than conception. So in other words, every conception of this God is wrong. Every conception of this God, we should be an atheist towards. We should we should reject as a type of idolatry. Um, so already the word God is fascinating because it is a word that might have an atheistic dimension woven into its very definition. So I don't know if you want to start there and we can kind of... Yeah, that's begin. excellent, Peter. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, you've spoken about Paul Tillich many times, uh, the German theologian, and I've read some of his stuff. It's, he's excellent. I'd say uh, uh, I'd say Hegel, yourself, and Tillich are my biggest influences theologically. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing to say. I'm going to have to take a snippet of that. Um, <laughs> I would not be worthy to uh, tie their sandals but i love but i those are two thinkers i deeply respect uh and you know you've you've hit on hegel and tillich as as uh very profound thinkers who i have sucked so much from yeah yeah certainly because tillich talks about and this probably connects to your idea that this theism and atheism they aren't as diametrically opposed or perhaps they are but at least there's a dance between them that, that goes on. And so Tillich says that uh, non-being is a part of being in a kind of a dialectical sense. And this probably gets me to one of your most interesting uh, or insightful concepts. So in many of your talks, you discuss that, you know, we have this, the Kantian notion, there's the there's what we can perceive, what we can, what we can know. And then he'd call it the thing in itself or that which we can't know, or, or to use a, like in term, I don't know if it's, it's a proper term, like das Ding or what, whatnot. But then you say, oh, but what, what Hegel did was Hegel said that this thing that was epistemological, he kind of says, no, it's it's ontological. Uh, so if if we could, let's, I hope this is not going to sound like uh, patronizing, but if we could, let's say, take that idea of, of the, what's epistemological and bring it to the, uh, not bringing it to the, but taking it to the ontological domain, to the readers of, to the audience that you wrote this book for, How Not to Speak of God, which are people that aren't particularly too keen on philosophy, let's say, how would you articulate that that concept? Yeah, okay, that's that's great. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll say where I start with that question, and then we maybe go a little bit deeper, but th that book that you held up there, which is my first book, um, How Not to Speak of God, that was written partly to introduce people to the richness of the mystical tradition and <clears throat> to the kind of the first kind of understanding of how atheism interacts with theism, which is where you get it in pseudo Dionysius and you get it in basically mystics right the way through to, you know, their, their heyday it was obviously in the past, but you still get some mystical thinkers um, in the modern world. Um, and it was this idea that doubt unknowing and complexity are not opposed to the life of faith but are part of the life of faith and that concept kind of introducing that I think that was especially when I wrote that book within some circles both theistic and atheistic was the idea that that religion was a thing of certainty was a thing of banishing doubt of banishing unknowing of having or pretending to have certainty and satisfaction um, and I, using Tillich is very good at this actually, is, is arguing that in the life of faith, there is an ongoing conversation, like almost being invited into theology is being invited into a conversation. It's almost like going to an art gallery and 
you know, instead of thinking that what unifies you with other people who love the same artist is that you have the correct interpretation of the same art. <laughs> um, it's more that you're all in love with the same art and it speaks to you in different ways. And when you go to the art gallery you and you engage with the art, you, you allow it to saturate you, you allow it to speak to you in ever new ways. So in a similar way, theology, and this is very true in the Jewish tradition, it's it's not an invitation into a set of dogmatic beliefs. It's an invitation into a set of questions and a set of conversations and a set of rituals and practices. So that was kind of the notion of the book. But I don't want to stop there. And you know, you mentioned the difference between epistemological unknowing and ontological unknowing, and that's very key. So Epistemological unknowing for your listeners and your watchers is basically the idea that there are things that we do not know. And of course, there's loads of things we don't know. And I, I watch YouTube videos and stuff I don't know all the time. I actually watch computer stuff sometimes because it's a it's an area I don't know anything about. And so I'll fall asleep listening to how it, what a chip is, or like how a computer works, right? So there's all these things that I don't know. Um, and then on top of that, that idea that there's things I don't know, but I could know, right? So there's that kind of unknowing. There's also unknowing of things that none of us know at the moment, but maybe in the future we'll know. So the idea that science is progressing and there's things in terms of physics and quantum particles that we don't currently know, um, that, you know, how they interact in certain ways and, um, you know, et cetera, what, you know, what, how the weak force and quantum gravity works, whatever, right? We do, but we'll one day will know. And then there's the Kantian notion, which you mentioned, which is, is there a type of reality that we can never know because we filter it through our minds, we filter it through our senses, we filter it through language. So there is a reality that is always unknown to us. It is knowable and it, as in it knows itself. It can kind of, it is a whole and substantive thing, but we cannot know it. So those are three types of epistemological unknowings. Um, ontological unknowing is kind of, this is where it gets more radical. I think, I think confessional Christianity can embrace all of the uh, epistemological unknowing. In fact, I think at its most mature form, it does that. Uh, what I want to argue for, and, you know, people don't have to go with me on this, but I'll, I'll set it out, um, it's something a little bit more radical. And this, if, if you allow me to tell a, a story, um, that oh, please I do. I love your stories. Yeah. Go for it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is this is actually a story that I told yeah. like thirty years ago. For thirty years ago, when I first started as a public speaker, um, and uh, I I I then dropped it, and I've only been telling it again very recently. <laughs> um, and so the story is about three people who all die on the same day in different parts of the world, right? This mystic, this pastor, and this fundamentalist preacher. And they all go up to heaven. And as you know, you have to get an interview with Jesus before you get into heaven, right? Matthew 14. So you have to, they're all sitting there. And um, uh, St. Paul comes out and says to uh, the mystic, okay, your turn for the, the interview. So the mystic goes in, little signs turned around on the door. And the mystic's in there for about an hour. And then he totters out and he smiles to himself and goes, ah, oh, I knew I was wrong. I knew I was wrong. And kind of walks into heaven. Next is the pastor's turn, this evangelical pastor. He gets up, goes into the interview room. He's in there for about three hours and he comes out, but he's distraught. He goes, how could I have been so wrong? And then he walks into heaven. And then finally it's the fundamentalist turn and he gets up. He's got a well-worn Bible with all of this highlighting. He walks into the office. It's closed, the little signs turned round. He's in there for about eight hours. And finally the door swings open and Jesus comes out and says, how could I have been so wrong? Right. <laughs> now, you know, that's a, that's God a himself. Little, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So that's a funny little story that, that I, when I told it originally, um, I told it naively. And by naively, I mean, I told it going, we're supposed to identify with the mystic, right? In that story, it's kind of a little funny, ha ha. And the mystic is the one who's right. The fundamentalist is wrong, right? But um, recently, I would say that I've been telling it and going, no, no, no. The fundamentalist is the one who is right. Or I'll say it in a more precise way. The fundamentalist is the one who experienced salvation in this moment in the interview room. Because 
what happened is the fundamentalist, and let's think of it as any young militant believer, I mean, any young militant, anything, but say a believer who knows the answer, knows the truth, and then they interrogate it. They're always interrogating the truth. They know the truth. They ask questions. Just like when I went to philosophy class as a 20-something-year-old, I already knew all the answers. I just needed philosophy to give me the justification for it, right? I was that, I was that confident. And what happened is I discovered that the lecturers didn't know. Right? And Heidegger talks about this. He says, it's not the students don't know and the lecturers know. The students all know and the lecturers don't. And the role of the lecturer, in a sense, is to bring you into a learned unknowing, to kind of open you up to a, a series of qu productive questions, become an hysteric in psychoanalytic terms. Right. So um, in this story, the mystic is the one who is a Kantian. It's epistemological unknowing. Hey, I don't know the truth. The truth is out there, but I don't know it. The fundamentalist encounters something absolutely traumatic, a subjective destitution, you'd call it, right? Because what is the fundamentalist experience? In questioning the absolute, in questioning absolute truth, absolute truth breaks and says, I don't know. So he discovers that there is an unknowing or an alienation at the heart of reality itself. Now, for me, that is the name of a type of salvation. Because, and here it is in a nutshell, is we as human beings are marked and we can we can unpack this but marked by a fundamental sense of lack to be a human is to be marked with a sense of something missing an oceanic oneness that we do not have and everyone's promising that they can fill that with psychedelics commodity satisfaction polyamory whatever you want you know you know new car everyone's got an answer to how to fill fill the lack um and <sighs> And, and, and the most religious place in the world is actually L.A., right? Because everyone there is promising certainty and satisfaction and wholeness and completeness. And on Instagram, everybody seems to be ungastrated. But if you go with this idea that we have a lack and then we, we encounter religion, we kind of go, God lacks the lack. And we want to be unified with the absolute so that we can get rid of this sense of alienation. Well, salvation in the radical tradition is the realization that God is alienated as well that lack or nothingness or castration is, is woven into the very nature of reality. And actually how we overcome alienation is by is not by overcoming it, but by redoubling it, by, by realizing that our own unhappiness, our own dissatisfaction is actually part of the nature of everything. And that actually it's a, it's a satisfying dissatisfaction. That's where all of our meaning and all of our suffering and all of our joy arises from and so in christianity i would argue that what you have in the death of god is the idea that i feel that i'm alienated from god and this is awful and then in christ i see oh god's alienated from god <laughs> and and in that experience of that of division within everything it loses death loses its sting it loses its weight. That lack loses its its negative its its negative power and becomes something affirmative. That's ontological unknowing. Sorry. So so epistemological unknowing is I do not know the absolute. Ontological knowing is the absolute does not know itself. There is novelty, spontaneity, and unknowing at the heart of everything. And then the kind of the theological line you draw is along with Zizek is this is where Christ goes on the cross. Eli Eli Lama Bhaktami. Father, Father, yes. why have thou forsaken me? And that is that moment where God himself, that's the ontological unknowing kind of yes. uh, portrayed in, in the Bible, let's say, right? Yeah, and, and potentially like that's that's the explosion of this idea within religion. You have, I mean, the, the idea of us feel, being separated from some oceanic oneness is common and everything even in certain forms of therapy the idea of the mother you're separated from the mother other and that's basically separation from this you know this being at the mother's breast this oneness so that's a form of that as well we're, we're it's it's a basically original blessing fall and then return that's the kind of religious paradigm um the uh, this instead is saying something more radical which is that um I mean, in a nutshell, is that the separation from the mother is what creates us. It's not that we have a unity and then we're separated. Is that subjectivity is the result of a fundamental death, a fundamental loss. And so it's, 
it constitutes us, which is what in theology you call original sin, or meaning original lack. There's a constitutive lack that is within us, and you don't get rid of the lack. You forgive the lack. So to pay a debt means to fill it. If I owe you a hundred bucks uh, and someone pays that debt, the, the debt is like a lack. There's a lack of money and the, someone pays it. If, if, someone for, if you forgive the debt, you don't fill it. You render the lack a lacking. You render the nothing a nothing. So the forgiveness of lack simply means that you don't overcome it but somehow you learn to live within it and it's robbed of its, its poison. Yeah. Peter. Also, I love how you, you say that uh, loss is something. And in fact, this was in one of your recent uh, talks loss is there was something and then you lose it, but lack is it. There isn't anything to lose in the first place. Uh, like yes. that negativity yes. itself is ontological or it's, it's there already. Yes. And so what lack does is lack generates the fantasy of something lost. And okay. yeah, so absolutely that's very important. To, and Todd McGowan is great on this. He, so loss is if I lose my keys, I had my keys and then I, of course I lost the keys, right? So that's what loss is, that there's a contingent loss. And of course there are contingent losses in life. And the video you're referencing, which I just put up recently, um, was I said like, uh, I was talking about how uh, sometimes in a relationship, people are terrified of it ending. They're terrified of a relationship ending, but actually it already has ended. They just haven't symbolized it. They haven't found a way to describe the catastrophes already occurred. Um, and then I used another example, which is sometimes someone is terrified of a relationship ending and they're, they have catastrophic apocalyptic fear. That's actually fear of a loss that happened when they were young. Maybe they lost a parent. Maybe they were sent off to boarding school and actually their, their terror of losing somebody in the presence is actually that they just haven't been able to symbolize the, the loss that they had when they were young. And if they're able to symbolize that, their fear begins to dissipate. So these are examples of, 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 of a loss, you know, something real, like you had a real relationship and it turned sour and the two people have not been able to symbolize it yet. So that's real, but lack is something ontological what it's a primal thing which means we are uh this is why i've talked about like there is life after death and we mm. are the evidence of it is that that there's some sort of death that we pass through we pass through this crucible of death in order to become subjects um and there was nothing pre it this is called the incest taboo in anth anthropology which is the idea that uh you cannot stay at one with your mother. You cannot stay in this private enjoyment. You have to separate into public enjoyment of, of the world. Now, you might hear in that, you might go, well, then there was a oneness because you and the mother were one. But but weirdly, you could say that the mother and the, the infant is, is not really two yet. The infant is still really a part of the mother. And it's as the separation occurs that the, the subject is formed, which is there's an I, but you can only have an I if there's a thou. You can only have an in, inner world if there's an outer world. So the infant separating from the mother is the formation of the, of, of the identity of the infant. And if this does not happen, uh, like if, if the mother-infant separation does not occur for some reason in a, in a healthy way, it, it often results in psychosis, which is where the subject's ego sense of self is fragmented or is is weak or dissipates entirely, you know? So these are the, the forms or, or, or in autism where there's a there's a, a sense of a, a certain disconnect the person has with, with social others, you know? So, you know, this is all connected. But, but when the separation occurs, what you've got is you've got a concrete biological mother Right. Mm. And you have the fantasy of the mother other, the mother God. Uh, so in other words, we as human beings are marked by a sense of something perfect. If I can give one example, actually, and it's a example from Shizek, and you'll you'll know this example. Um, he said he went to see a movie, um, and then the, the movie was based on a novel, and the movie wasn't great. Oh, yes, I know there was awesome. something missing in it. I know this is my favorite example of the unconscious. <laughs> uh, he says, there's something missing in this movie. Right. And so he went, ah, I'm going to go back and read the novel. So, you know, the, 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 the absence that was in the in the movie pointed to the novel. 
But then he went and he read the novel and it was even worse, right? It really was missing something. So now he's got two concretely existing artifacts, the movie and the book, that both seem to be missing something. So they point to a third, a third manuscript, which we'll let's call it Q, like in the biblical tradition, the Q manuscript, right? But that manuscript doesn't exist. It, it, it insists as a virtual a particle, a virtual entity um, that created by a kind of a sense of something missing within the two concretely existing things. So what you can discover then is through two concrete failures, the fantasy of something that is whole and, and complete arises and we orbit around that. Yeah, and in, in, in many ways, I feel like that kind of fantasy is also what makes us move, right? It, it's kind of... Yeah. It's hard to even like, which is why you know, uh, like Lacan says that uh, to think you stepped outside the fantasy makes you the biggest idiot of them all. <laughs> you know, you, you can't really step out outside of it. Yeah. Yes, no, absolutely. And, and th this is very key. So I'll give you a clinical example, really, of of how this works. Um, a guy who was having trouble in his sexual life, and and he went to a psychoanalyst, and during the talking about with the, his. Uh, analyst and he was talking about this desire to be humiliated uh, in, the, in his sexual life and he references when he was 15 years old he was at a bus stop and there were these girls and they were laughing and joking and pointing to him and he felt really embarrassed he left the bus stop and walked home but also there was something very intriguing about this these this woman's desire they were it seemed like they were getting their pleasure their jouissance from laughing at him and and looking at him and and he was very drawn by that and also terrified by it. And then he made a connection to when he was very young, going to his sister's bedroom and knocking on the door when she was with her friends and trying to annoy them. And sometimes they would let him in and then they would embarrass him. They'd ask him questions and they would maybe put makeup on him. And he, he didn't know at the time that they were making fun of him, but he knew they were extracting pleasure from him. And so what you can see in this example is, at 15, he has this experience of the other's enigmatic desire, right? So there's this the enigmatic desire of the other, and we call that object A in psychoanalysis. There's something appealing about what do they want? What do those girls want? And then he was able to connect it to this very early experience of exactly the same thing. Structurally, they're very similar, right? And that's what's called das Ding. You mentioned das Ding, which is the black box of the other's desire for all of us when we're infants, there's there's a question starts to arise is why am I desirable to the other? What 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 makes me desirable? How can I extract that desire? How can I harvest that desire? Right. So we are little energy vampires. We're desire vampires. We desire the desire of the ones we desire. And we can never fully answer that question. So you have these triangulation for this guy of two. So it's like this. This early experience does not give an answer to the later experience that's bad psychoanalysis where you kind of you're looking to the past to find the answer right what you, you find and levi strauss is very good on this with the idea of myth that myth doesn't answer questions it it doubly twists them it it kind of it redoubles but it redoubles the the question in a way that is an answer right so you have this 15 year old experience connects with this early experience and then what you have is you have the person fantasizes an answer to the question of what do these women want from me, right? And the, and the fantasy life of that person is not a reflection of their desire. It's a reflection of how they think the other desires them, right? Our masturbatory fantasies are really uh, a little window into how we think the other desires us. So, and, so in other words, you know, the trauma is not like some concrete substantive, ah, there it is. The, it, it's it's connected around the question of what does the other want from us? And fantasy is the answer to that question. And we revolve around it. And that's not good or bad. That's just kind of the way things are. But but acknowledging and knowing that provides us a little bit of purchase on it, which could be called traversing the fantasy in Lacanianism. Yeah. Um, all right, Peter. So I think I have two uh, questions that still pertain to, let's say, they're more existential questions, questions that aren't overtly philosophical or theoretical. And then I have two questions. One's on uh, Kierkegaard, and the other one is on the uh, 
I'm curious because I haven't really heard you develop this idea in many places, the ethics of pyrotheology, given that you have embarked on this project, I'm wondering, um, are there any ethical dimensions? This is this idea of pyrotheology or the uh, unknowing God. Although, although before, before we get there, um, I think one of the best things that you do is you really uh, frame this, this, our modern religion, the religion of pure positivity, uh, rather, rather brilliantly. Um, and I, I, I guess what, what, where does Christianity and grace differ from the religion of self-help or the religion of pure positivity? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So two things I could say about that uh, initially um, is, I mean, and I, I get this from a really beautiful book, an early book of Todd McGowan's called The End of Dissatisfaction. But in that book, he kind of articulates three notions, three different types of God that we can think about. And one is uh, the kind of God that Freud talked about when he talked about the primal father, which is the notion of there is one exception to castration, right? So all of us as human beings are dissatisfied to some extent in our relationships, in our work, in our lives, right? That's that's kind of maybe a, a feature that unifies us all, right? But there's one exception to that, and that's God. Right. Mm. Or in a more secular way, the one exception is the Lord who lives down the road in feudal times, the one who has everything. Right. And we all are kind of suffering. So there's an exception. We are all marked by a certain lack and there is one that lacks the lack. Right. And in the Freudian thing, which is the primal horde and the primal father who has all of the, the, the sexual relations he wants and all of the resources he wants in this kind of mythical past. And then eventually the tribe get together, kill the father and then set up some rules, right? That we're, you know, so that no, nobody becomes the ungastrated other again. So that's the Freudian notion. And then there's a taboo, a memory of this, a memory of this uncastrated father, which is kind of the marking of religion for, for Freud, is that the, the, this totem of an uncastrated other, a, a one that lacks the lack. Now, that God really no longer exists in any substantive way, but you could say that's the God of, say, feudalism, where, again, everybody goes, I'm lacking. You know, you have to because there's no upward mobility. There's nothing that, you know, you have to marry a particular person. You have to do a particular thing and it's not a great way to live. Right. But that's the God of the, the God of castration. Then let's talk about the modern God. You could say is the God of the demand to enjoy. Right. Mm. And the God of the demand to enjoy is this message that is that infuses everything that God's not castrated and you don't have to be. Right. You can have, you know, pure positivity, be an entrepreneur of the self, achieve, have oneness through, you know, a certain kind of psychedelic enlightenment or through, say, commodity satisfaction, owning a certain amount of things through certain diets and whatever it is like when you go on to in social media, there's almost this sense of you're surrounded by uncastrated people. They seem uncastrated and they're selling you products that mean you don't have to be castrated. Right now, this God of the demand to enjoy causes a whole pile of problems, which are things like jealousy and envy, social fragmentation, right? There's all of this thing where everybody else seems to be having a good time except for you, um, or that you get the things that are supposed to work and they don't, which, is, which creates this kind of weird form of, of alienation when you feel like you should. I've got a friend who's a very famous actor who's he became a very well-known actor and the alienation he felt he couldn't put words to he said i've got everything i got everything i was told that would make it would make me no longer alienated i feel awful i'm falling apart and yet couldn't symbolize it because in a sense you've got it right and now this generates this progressive position generates reactive politics right so some people then go to conservative churches or whatever in order to mitigate their anxiety at this pure positivity the entrepreneur of the self that that which creates fatigue creates burnout creates adhd all these symptoms that are modern symptoms right that this pure positivity creates um then can often go back to somewhere like hillsong precisely because it's easier to date whenever you've got constraints than whenever you don't, right? In LA, no one's dating whenever you're able to do whatever you want. You know, uh, This is what Lacan meant when he said, if God is dead, nothing is permissible, which which mm. is a dig at Sartre, but um, where he kind of means that whenever you've got a, a 
whenever you're in a position of pure positivity where you can really do anything and be anything and even the government and corporations are saying just do it do it do it do it um it actually creates so much anxiety and stagnation and you end up becoming more and more close to the world and you experience people being more and more toxic you become more and more fearful of the other and then your sexual relationships become contractual you prefer to have an only fans relationship that protects you from the toxicity of real people than the danger of a real person right so all of these problems that we're experiencing so um what is the answer and so for me the answer here is you have to go through to the idea that we're all orchestrated including god the God, so in what in the first we're all castrated except for God. The second, none of us need to be castrated. The third is that, that everything is castrated, and what that means is that a lot of us and a lot of depression, a lot of fatigue and burnout is because we fantasize some alternative world where everything is better. If I'd been with that woman or that man, everything would have been better. So you have an old philosophical alternative possible world that, that where everything worked out. Oh, if only I'd taken that job. And so your depression is directly connected to this fantasy of an undivided possible world that you're not in. You're in the actual world where you're, where it's shit. But you've got this vision of a, of a, of a possible world where it worked. Um, if you can realize that the vision is in all possible worlds as well as the actual world, right? Um, then in a sense, life can be more difficult or less difficult, but you're not frenetically pursuing some end of castration. You're realizing, in fact, that there's something about sacrifice itself that is enjoyable and is good. Um, this, I, I, this is where we get into the ethics a little bit. Um, maybe I should hold off on that for a second and say um, there was one other thing that I wanted to say about your question. Um, well, I'll say this about the ethics is that um, it was thing, interesting about our contemporary economic system, and which uh, someone like Todd McGowan and Slavoj Shizek is very brilliant on, is that the capitalist system actually gives us what we want in many ways, right? And you go, it never gives us what we want, right? The capitalist system never gives us what we want because because every time we get it, it's not it, right? Like the new iPhone 15s just come out. Like, and of course, like the, all these basically smartphones have hit their limit, right? So, but they try to still pretend that the, the iPhone 15 is something special. And then you get it and you go like, that's not it. So so the, arg the traditional argument is capitalism never gives you what you want. It always dangles it in front of you, never gives it. But what McGowan argues in Capitalism and Desire is that, well, capitalism does give you what you want because what we want is dissatisfaction. What we want is precisely not getting the thing. Oh, I, I, this brings us very much to uh, to grace and self help. That's brilliant. That's what I wanted to say that. But yeah, so we'll keep going with this. Is um, so capitalism in a way dangles something in front of you, but precisely by always failing to get it. <sighs> There's a certain, you don't consciously want that. It causes you suffering and pain, but you're getting something that keeps your desire alive, right? So what is the problem? Well, the problem you could say is that you you don't see your enjoyment. Capitalism uh, hides where the enjoyment is. It pretends that it's the sacrifice of sacrifice is the answer. So it gives you the fantasy of winning the lottery or retiring by the beach and you'll be able to sacrifice, sacrifice and finally be happy, right? Not realizing that if you retire and go to the beach and do nothing, you'll probably be dead within a year or two because you've got nothing, right? So even, that's why people often work in horrible jobs rather than retire and go, why is this guy working until he's 75? Because deep down, he knows that even if the work is not great, it's better than not doing anything, right? So... So it's, capitalism hides the truth that there's something about sacrifice that's important. And it hides it from everybody, even hides it from the winners. In capitalism, the losers lose, but the winners even lose. They The, the losers lose doubly, but even if you get become a billionaire, it doesn't fix it, right? You just get a nice, you know, get a nicer house. And also you're, you're in a much better position, but you still don't get over alienation. So um, the, the answer is, how do we see and enjoy our dissatisfaction and i'll give a concrete example of this a friend of mine who always was getting into fights with his wife and his wife was always blaming him for things and in all honesty he deserved it half the time right but he's a nice guy as well <laughs> and he, he was always getting in trouble and he was saying to me i'm just sick of it he says you know i've been married for you know 15 years or whatever um and i'm just always in the doghouse i'm always having to apologize i'm just dumb 
but as we were talking, I was able to say, listen, I know you, mate. Like, you love to win people over. He's You're a natural salesperson. He's done sales most of his life in one way or another, right? And you love to win someone over. And I said, I know your partner. She loves to be won over, right? You know, in a way, unconsciously, you guys are getting your enjoyment, right? If she make, puts you in the kind of, metaphorical doghouse and then you have to win her back by buying her flowers and bringing her on a nice weekend because like what if you're both unconsciously enacting your enjoyment now the problem is you're not enjoying your enjoyment because it's hidden right it's not seen so you're trying to get away from it right what if you just see it for what it is and as soon as he saw that he just started smiling. He's like, oh, brilliant. And he went back to win his wife over. In other words, <laughs> he was already getting his enjoyment. He just didn't realize. It. And so he was able to now enact it in a, in a better way. So here's the, de- here's the critique of self-help. Self-help goes, I want to bring you from A to B. So for example, self-help might say to him, right, here's a way to, you know, make sure you're not in trouble as much or get into a better relationship or whatever. So moving to A to B. Grace is the technology that simply where you accept that you're accepted, which means you don't have to move from A to B, right? You sit. But what Grace does is Grace shows that A does not equal A. So if if self-help is always how you get from A to B, Grace is A does not equal A. And what I mean by that is that you are riven by an unconscious knowledge right? You are not who you think you are, right? You think you want to get away from that disruptive practice, but you don't, right? A does not equal A. There's a whole pile of unconscious things, enjoyments going on. And what grace does is it allows you the space where you can ask this very traumatic question. What am I getting out of the situation that I think I'm just passively observing, right? So sometimes we are passively observing something, but sometimes, so for example, sometimes if you think someone's breaking into your house at night, Yeah, you may have heard a noise and you don't usually hear that noise. That's fine. But if every night you think it, right, you you passively think that someone's breaking into your house, you're not passively thinking that. You're actively in it and you're getting something from that. Grace provides a space where you can ask this question and symbolize, put language to, to that suffering and that enjoyment. And the act of being able to do that, I would argue, is fundamentally transformative. It can change. So not moving, simply accepting that you're accepted, seeing your surplus enjoyment is enough to radically transform the way you interact with the world. And that's grace as opposed to self-help. Yeah, the only thing I'd add on to that, Peter, is something I've been thinking about is I don't know if that's something we as subjects under capitalism can do in any kind of natural way. As in, I feel a lot of us, in fact, find it quite traumatic to accept grace because just to even plainly, you know, in in, in a very secular sense to to accept that we are loved for who we are. We may even say it, but unconsciously, it's something that's rather traumatic. I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are. No, you're 100% right. And uh, she's ex brilliant on this as well. It's like he used the matrix as an example because a lot of people in the, I lived in LA for many years and a lot of people there talk about kind of enlightenment as this really beautiful thing and kind of like freeing mm. yourself from Nirvana, ideology. Yeah. yeah, right. And it's, it's wonderful. And it's, oh, this is one of the interesting things about Christianity is salvation is crucifixion, is death. It's horrific, right? And I would say that is that that in psychoanalysis is this freedom is not emancipatory in the sense of like, oh, it feels lovely and wide and I feel at one with everything. No, it's it's you you wake up like in the matrix in a tiny like goo filled body bag and it's quite horrific. And the movie They Live beautifully captures this mm-hmm. where uh, they put on these glasses and then they see their surplus enjoyment. They see the what keeps them attached to i mean they live is a perfect example of this by the way because they live aliens have taken over the world they're sucking the earth dry of its resources and it keeps the the world docile through subliminal messaging through everything magazines tv and so the magazine for example will say oh get rich go on holiday you know achieve your dreams just do it right that's the that's what you see but when you put on the glasses these special glasses you see behind it it says be docile don't question authority sleep eat work you know like marry and reproduce whatever it is and now the funny thing about these glasses is you wear them for too long they hurt you they give you headaches like it's painful to see through because it is painful to see our surplus enjoyment. A great example that Alanka Sapanchich uses is this little old joke you'll know that 
about this horrible man who goes home to his wife, turns on the TV, and there's some adverts on, and he says, get me a beer before it starts. And uh, he's waiting, looking at the TV here, yeah? and she gets him a beer, and then he drinks it, and the adverts are still on. He says, listen, it's about to start. Get me another beer. And she's like, okay. And she gets him another beer thing. Well, I suppose he was working all day. He drinks that. And he says, listen, it's about to start. Get me another beer. And she blows up. And she says, you get your own bloody beer. You think I'm just here to serve you? And he looks at her and he says, ah, I told you it was about to start. Told you it was about to start. <laughs> and I love this and, joke. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Because that's the perfect example of how analysis can work for a neurotic is that that guy thinks he's a passive recipient of the argument. He's going like, I'm just a passive, you know, it's about to start. She's about to kick off. He doesn't realize that he is actively in the argument and, and, and precipitating it. And if that was an analysis, if I had that dream and I said, oh, I came home and I was really tired and I was waiting for a, a football game to start on TV. And I asked my partner to get me a drink before it started. And then I asked her to get me another drink before it started. And then she blew up at me. The analyst's intervention at that point would be, oh, and so it started, right? So because that, if she said that, oh, and so it started, I would be confronted with the idea of, oh, oh, I'm enjoying that. I, I was waiting for the argument to start. What am I getting from the argument? Why do I, like my friend and his partner, they were, they're getting into arguments, thinking it's passive, like thinking they're just, it's because of the other person, not realizing that their enjoyment is within it. But in that act of saying, oh, so it started, if that was say that was a dream and my analyst intervened with those words, I might suddenly by being confronted with my enjoyment change. But that is a painful thing. And you touch on the exact reason why I am an institutionalist of sorts. Like I'm trying to create community, communes, I would call them communes of contradiction uh, in which we go through this process together because although it is emancipatory, although it is ex in, 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 an amazing experience, it is a painful and difficult experience. It requires music to help us feel it. It requires sermons to help us cognize it. And it requires rituals for us to incarnate it. And it requires fidelity to this event. It requires us looking out for each other. Um, this ontological unknowing is profoundly difficult and requires a lot of effort and courage. Just as my example of the couple who the relationship might already be over. So they don't have to, they don't have to say, they don't have to have the courage to end it. It already is over, right? It's like the cat, the cartoon cat off the cliff. Its mm. legs are going it's already off the cliff, just has to look down. You just have to have the courage to symbolize it, but you have to pass through the crucible of death to get to life. That's it. There is no moving to life and everlasting life. You pass through death. Yeah, Peter, perhaps I, I wanted to talk to you about uh, character card because uh, I've been sharing a lot of your work with one of my mates who would probably call himself a character guardian Christian because for him, he still has the other, that, that God kind of beyond reality is still uh, complete. Although, although uh, I, I don't want to derail this, this line of, uh, of our conversation because I, this gets me thinking uh, in this community of, let's say, contradiction you're, you're trying to build through power of theology, through your work, what would you say, uh, and, and perhaps you haven't really developed this quite a lot yet, are the, the ethical, political dimensions of this kind of community as in if we are to collectively build this sort of community what would it look like if i could yes. put it in like a very crass way yeah no absolutely and this brings us back to that the the three types of god thing i was talking about where the third this notion that that um a kind of asymmetry or contradiction is woven throughout reality and you know you could say that uh in the modern world at various times, or not in the let's say in human history, this contradiction eventually uh, arises in every domain, right? Mm. And uh, I'd be interested in where it arises within computer stuff. Got some ideas about that. But um, so, for example, the not at oneness of the political body of the social body is as uh, is called democracy right so democracy is a sense of non at oneness of the social body with itself that generates civilization right the non at oneness of the organic body is called evolution right that the kind of the the the, the biological body is in a sense in a type of 
series of contradictions that generate complexity. The non-at-oneness of uh, in the realm of mathematics would be Gödel's incompleteness theorem, right? The non-at-oneness within the realm of psychology is the unconscious, the unconscious being the name for the non-at-oneness of consciousness with itself, uh, as opposed to a union unconscious, which is more substantive. Yeah. Um, the name for this in physics is quantum indeterminacy, superpositioning, right? The idea that uh, that actually physical reality is in a type of asymmetry with itself. So in, in various domains, we come to find, like, so basically, if you want to put Hegel in a nutshell, Hegel says that everything is an attempt to reconcile contradiction. So right through the universe, there's there's some sort of asymmetry and complexity. And, and as it tries to resolve it, what happens is you move into another level, right? And you keep moving. And Hegel, instead of the vision, like the kind of like a, a tile hard, a short arm vision or whatever, of almost of overcoming contradiction, uh, Hegel says you just deepen it. Contradiction gets deeper and deeper and deeper until you realize that contradiction is woven into reality. And that's that's the, that's what Levi Strauss meant by his what's called the canonical formula or the double twist formula, where he basically says that mythology does not resolve a question. It um it knots it in a in a very complex way. Um and so, and that's what Hegel calls absolute knowledge. Absolute knowledge is the knowledge that there is no absolute knowledge, that, or that that there is a type of uh, openness and novelty within everything, and that's the name for absolute knowledge. Now, and and you see this in proper psychoanalysis. You go to an analyst, and maybe you've got a symptom, and it's like you're you're clenching your jaw, you're clenching your jaw, and through analysis, you go, oh, I'm really angry with my partner. I want to shout at her. But if I shout at her, I'm scared she's going to leave me. And so I'm clenching my jaw because that means I, I want to open my mouth and I want to keep it shut. Now, then that contradiction is maybe deepened of going, well, that's actually displaced. That's how I feel about my boss, uh, you know, at work. And then you go, and actually it's how I felt with my mother when I was a child. And what you find is, is the contradiction is not overcome it's deepened it gets deeper and deeper and deeper until the cure the cure is where you go oh to be human is to want to speak and not speak to be human is to speak and also to realize that you cannot speak that always there's something that remains unsaid right and then you come to terms with that contradiction and there's a certain freedom so that's the salvatory dimension of this which is a collective in which we come to absolute knowledge we come to directly embrace the unknowing. So if I if I'll give you the perfect, let's call it post-capitalist couple, um, is a a a, per, a a purchaser, a customer, right, who never buys the product, right? So you want to buy a car, you go and you keep test driving, looking through the magazines, going online, doing all of that, but you directly realize that your enjoyment is not the car, it's in looking at the car, it's in the block to the car, right? So you directly enjoy the opposition, you directly enjoy the impossibility, right? And combine that with a salesperson who doesn't want to sell you the car. I had a, I have a friend, she was buying a boat, and a small boat, and the guy who she was buying it off just put her off, just said, listen, you don't want to do this, it's going to cost you way too much money, much more than you'll expect. And it's a very Irish thing to have a, to have a, a shopkeeper who tries not to sell you the product, right? <laughs> but if you have the perfect couple of a shop, of a, of a customer who doesn't want to buy, and a salesperson who doesn't want to sell, but who directly enjoy the impossibility itself, that is actually a very radical picture of a type that has very, very important political uh, connotations and economic connotations. So the Church of the Contradiction is about creating groups of people who are disinvested from this libidinal pursuit for certainty and satisfaction, where they directly realize that that the the rebel, the Camus rebel, right? I mean, Camus basically said the revolutionary is someone who's not happy until the kingdom comes that's in the future. The conservative isn't happy until they go back to the kingdom that was lost. So the revolutionary and the conservative are both unhappy people who one looks to the future, one looks to the past. And if they ever get what they're looking for, it's never what they think, right? If the conservative gets their old past, 
um, they rebuild a 1950s America or whatever, you know, it doesn't work. And the revolutionary gets the, the revolutionary future ends up usually getting hung by those people, right? But then Camus says, who is the rebel? Well, the rebel is someone who loves to fight for change, who loves to fight for a kind of the better world, but who directly enjoys the fight itself directly enjoys the dissatisfaction and the struggle. The kingdom of God, where is it? It is within us where we love. And what is love? But creating a harbor for the unknown dimension of the other, where we kind of open ourselves up to that unknown dimension we and they do to us. So all of that to say, that is, I think that has profound political and ethical uh, outworkings. Yeah, just on a side note, uh, Peter, I think it's it's only you and a few other people that can that can say uh, Hegel in a nutshell. <laughs> when you just made that passing <laughs> comment, it made me <laughs> laugh. Yeah. Hegel in a nutshell. I love I love that. Oh um, yeah, very good. I was I was I was thinking the other day that um, I should read Hegel in German because I don't, well, but I don't know, I don't know German, yes, but uh, I but I don't understand them in English, so we may as well not understand them. In German. <laughs> Might as well. Yeah, there you go. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And just on the idea of contradiction, though, yeah, it's also I think Zizek is, is is quite big on this. He says we need to go uh, back to Hegel, from Marx back to Hegel, and I think for him it's fundamentally uh, acknowledging this 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 own tech contradiction to being itself. Um, yes, uh, that that that's very key. By the way, is that, that I, this is where I think this is why Zizek he was very important to me for a number of reasons, but one of them was he this return to Hegel and this this kind of passing through Marx because in a sense here's what happened after after Hegel died uh there were the young Hegelians and they were that people like Feuerbach and Marx um uh Steiner they various there were the young Hegelians they, they they were very talented smart but they did not like the religious Hegel they did not like the Hegel who talked about the state so they went with kind of Hegel's radical thought and then there were the kind of right Hegelians and they were more theological conservative in nature and they liked Hegel's religion and views on the state but but what what happened and this this is what McGowan calls the right-wing deviation of the left which is what I think we're in today because I think ultimately right wing, um, right and left are very not useful terms anymore. So I use them with a pinch of salt. But it, it, McGowan's argument is that a right wing enjoyment is an enjoyment that scapegoats, that turns lack into loss. So there is a contingent alienation that can be overcome. And the reason why it's not being overcome is because of some group right, immigrants or the Jews or whatever, whoever it is, some group is preventing, you know, the, 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 the organic whole society. Now, the left today are then a right-wing deviation of the right, because a right-wing deviation of the left, because you see in a lot of what who people call themselves leftists, um, contingent loss, scapegoating, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But for someone like McGowan, left-wing enjoyment is precisely realizing that, precisely realizing lack that contradiction is woven into everything. And while there are enemies to fight and there are things to do, one can never overcome alienation except in the redoubling of alienation. And Shizek's argument is to really get that, we have to go back to Hegel and where leftist politics kind of went wrong was by ditching a whole pile of Hegel. And that's that's why that's why people like McGowan and Shizek are returning to Hegel because we lost something very important when the young Hegelians got rid of religion. Mm. Because for Hegel, religion, it, it, you know, Christianity is um is a uh way of expressing that you cannot overcome contradiction. <laughs> Yeah, have you read uh, Tom McGavin's Emancipation After Hegel? Uh, it's a brilliant book. Uh, for anybody who's interested in Hegel, that's the book I recommend. Yeah, yeah, it's probably the only uh, one of the probably one of the only books where I read it. I was like, oh, I understood a book on Hegel. <laughs> so it was yes, a yeah, so beautifully written. Yeah, yeah. so beautifully written. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Peter, I have heard you mention Kierkegaard in some of your work, but the reason Kierkegaard is important for me is in fact. Out of love, not love for Kierkegaard, but love for my best mate. Uh, so he is a massive Kierkegaardian, and him and I we've been going at this quite a bit. Where uh, I even shared uh, some of your talks with him, and he he essentially says that his his problem is that, uh, and when he says you, he means he's referring to you here because I sent one of your talks that you conflate reality with God, 
And then in kind of typical Kierkegaardian where he's in, for, for him, God is something beyond reality, something that's unspoken of. And then, of course, Kierkegaard being a very kind of pious Christian and, and uh, he's a theologian after all, um, this is very clear that he believes in this absolute God. And, and he even says that uh, uh, in, in, like, in the eyes of God, we are always in the room. Um, so just what are, your, what are your intimations when you hear the name Kierkegaard and that kind of thinking where there, is this, there still is a beyond, beyond our reality, so to speak? Yes, well, you know, I have a huge amount of respect for Kierkegaard. It's very hard not to. He's an incredible thinker. Sure. Um, so, uh, and and one of the things that I get out of his work, as not someone who's a very close reader of him, he's I I would I sometimes think of him as my favorite least read philosopher, as in a philosopher who my love of him and the amount that I've read is is not weirdly not connected, you know, um, but. What I've got from my reading of him, particularly like for like a book like Fear and Trembling, is that faith is a kind of like embrace of contradiction. It's a it's a living within this. And that's that's what I love about him. But you've you've put you the you've hit the nail on the head with exactly where my critique of him is, is that that he embraces this idea of faith as a type of, I mean, this is this is my this would be my one of my critiques of someone like Jordan Peterson and his reading of the Bible. If you ever look at Peterson's reading of the biblical text, the biblical text is about providing wisdom. It's about providing uh, moral understanding. Now, there's something interesting about this with Peterson because Peterson has this kind of real love of of the depth of religion, and his fear is that a kind of uh, a type of one dimensional secularism disconnects us from this deep well of stories and traditions that can help us touch deep parts of ourselves and others right so there's a very Jungian reading of the biblical text as so whenever he does a close reading of exodus or genesis you'll hear every verse almost is a is a kind of aphorism of wisdom as to how we should act but that's exact opposite with Kierkegaard, right? The, the Bible is exactly like the, the thing that destroys our wisdom and our ethics, right? Uh, so for Kierkegaard, he says, like, you can say anything you want about Jesus and I'll be fine, but don't ever call him a wise man or an He's ethical not a wise man. Guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, the whole Bible starts, or is the, the person of faith, the man of faith, is, is a guy who goes up to a mountaintop to kill his kid because he heard a voice from God. Yeah. 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 He's, like, a, he's like, a lunatic, yeah. Yeah. Like, mad, mad. Like, and, and like Kierkegaard enjoys like he literally enjoys painting a kind of Peterson figure to be honest like in a in a church trying to make that into a, into a wisdom into an ethics right and, and all of the all of the uh the funny maneuvers you have to make to kind of like the uh, like a like a uh, choreography you have to do to make that a wise thing you know and Kierkegaard wants to go no this is madness you know when there's, there's something trauma again the trauma there's something traumatic about the biblical text there's something fundamentally ruptures our notions of wisdom and knowledge and so and that's the Kierkegaard I love right um but Likewise. at the end of the day yeah yes your friend is right that, that Kier, and this is where the young Bart is very Kierkegaardian is that there is God is like an absolute no which is wonderful an absolute no to our yes so every time we build a political or ethical kingdom like God, the name God is the name for some for a wrecking ball, right? And um, I I love that I love that notion. However, this is where I think Kierkegaard just doesn't doesn't push far enough. Is that is it? It's a Kantian ultimately a Kantian notion. Um, now with your friend, that's a really interesting critique. It says like I conflate God with you know reality. To say something about that is, I would want to argue that let's say theology is theology is interesting. It's a practice and it's a theory. So theology is, there's usually a community connected to it, but also theology is interested in that which is otherwise than being, otherwise in reality. I would say like, if you're going to boil it down into a nutshell, theology is, looks at and is interested in what is not explicable in purely materialistic terms. Now, there's a whole pile of ways of understanding what is otherwise than being. You know, we sometimes call it mind, right? It's traditional soul, which is usually mind, but it means mind in philosophy. Is, so that non-material dimension of us, right? Also, object A, das Ding, is otherwise than being. So there's, there's, you know, and 
so I would say, I would want to say to your friend, I think he's kind of right. Like he's picking up something correct in a way, but I don't want to conflate reality with, with let's say the signifier of God. I, I want to be theological in a sense. Of, I think there is a reality that is otherwise than being. And that reality in a sense is more real than what's around us. And yet it's just like that movie and that book creates the third, right? That that Q text, which is more real than than what's real, right? It's and and it almost it is created by the failure of the movie and the failure of the book. So it's formed by that. And yet it is the cause of the failure of the movie and the book, right? So just as some some as a traditional theologian might say, Jesus was born in time and yet is eternal. I want to say there is an otherwise in being which is eternal that comes into being through material reality. So I don't want to conflate the this notion of uh, otherwise than being. I don't want to conflate that with reality. I want to say that that anyone worth their salt in this frame is is trying to articulate what Lacan calls the real, capital R real, mm -hmm. the real being ironically what is not real <laughs> but the real being this otherwise than being and my issue with Kierkegaard is that otherwise than being is substantive it is a Kantian substantive and ultimately it means that um we can never it almost is like what Hegel would call the um what did he call it the uh uh, the the sinner, the unhappy sinner, I think he calls it, whereas basically we can never, uh, we're always separated from ultimate reality. I mean, the whole thing about Hegel is he Hegel says, well, whenever you realize that ultimate reality is separated from itself, that alienation is overcome. So for Kierkegaard, I think alienation remains an issue. It's too substantive. And uh, uh, yeah, and 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 I I want to. That's why I think uh, Hegel uh, is a better figure. And would you say, Peter? It took me a while to get where you're getting. I think I think I'm 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 starting to make sense of this. So would you say that uh, the the character guardian, quote unquote, real is again something that's there. It's it's a substance. It's God, whatever you may call that. Something that's complete. Whereas as Zizek puts it, the the Lacanian real. It's when there's a failure in the symbolic order. And for you, the 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 other wise of being comes to being, so to speak, from the failure of our being. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Now I will say this because I'm always nervous about this because, like, in terms of what I'm trying to do, I I generally am I'm well I'm very open to anyone who tries to maintain this otherwise than being in whichever way they do it. But yes, ultimately, when you push to where I am, philosophically speaking, my theoretical frame, the theoretical frame that I feel, rightly or wrongly, is more um, uh, robust, is the idea that God is the signifier of the failure itself. So yeah, and, and so there is a kind of like, there is kind of a rupture. And for me, so God is not the signifier of that substance, which is beyond our understanding so much as God is the signifier for something that is unknown, but it is a it's an, an unknown unknown. It's a type of radical asymmetry within reality itself, generated by a figure. Yes. Yes. And also the fact that you kind of brought up the union unconscious, because uh, uh, kind of the caricature Freudian unconsciousness, it's this deep, profound thing, like a uh, the iceberg. Uh, metaphor right it's this deep thing that's there that you can and all our real self is there <laughs> yeah. Jurek says uh, if you truly look into yourself what you find is you're full of shit <laughs> because <laughs> of the, the unconscious really comes in the contradictions it's not something within you in, in yes and it's very hard to grasp I mean this this is why I think the union unconscious and Stephen I think in Melanie Kleiner's but Melanie Klein, is yeah. so to people yeah is that they um it becomes as a receptacle that has lots of content or, for, you know, it's a substantive thing. And for, for, for Jung, it's like a yin and yang where there's consciousness, there's unconsciousness. And for him in his, his papers on the unconscious, you, you get, he very is clear about this, that the unconscious almost brings out uh, the opposite. So if you, if you are, uh, look at someone too poorly in your unconscious, they might look like a king 
right? So the, the unconscious is almost trying to rectify, like if there's too much chaos, it brings calm and vice versa. So it's this balance. But the the Freudian unconscious, especially as it develops into Lacan, like, okay. is not a substantive other. It is sim it is the name for the rupture self. And that's hard to grasp because, and, so, and I find it hard to grasp because, you know, whenever... Well, this is the young, this is the Freudian parapraxis slips of the tongue. Why is a psychoanalyst always interested in not what you say, but in what you feel to say in some failure? You know, you mention someone's name by accident, you mistakenly say something. Um, it's so there's something being said, and then it's very easy to think that's substantive, right? That something's speaking that shows that you have a substantive hatred for your father when you really think you love them, you really dislike them, but. A better analogy for the unconscious is it's like the quantum dimension in physics, which is not con constituted until it kind of is observed, until until it's measured. The measurement constitutes it. So it's almost like that we are, our consciousness is is disrupted in various ways. And as we put language to that disruption, it becomes substantive at a conscious level, but it, but it wasn't constituted substantively before you put language to it. That's a hard thing to get your head around, but I think it's ultimately a much better notion than some, as you say, the iceberg, which is you have substantive unconscious things. That's just called the pre-conscious. You know, that's not unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting is I haven't read uh, much of Jung's papers, but his, in his, uh, autobiography he he uh he conflates god with the unconscious he just says god is the unconscious and in a rather funny way uh, and at the time when he was writing this a lot of conservative let's say christian theologians were kind of being dismissive of psychoanalysis because they thought oh these people are reducing god to just some psychological phenomena uh, but that was because they were viewing psychoanalysis through this lens of union substantial unconscious uh and sorry Peter, i know i'm cognizant of time but just w one more thing um Zizek also points out that you know currently we're going through this kind of ai revolution in our culture at least ostensibly uh and that one thing that llm so large language models like all these chat gpd and whatnot what they probably don't have is where and I, i'm becoming this is very speculative here but is that it, it the the problem with LLMs is they they can't in in their language it's well, everything that an LLM is what they substantially say what the agent declares it doesn't account for the ne the negative the negation the the contradiction and I don't know if you yeah. could put that into an LLM the way we, we as human subjects have it. Yes, no, I, that's very true, and she's ex written on that very well, and Hegel and the Wired Brain, but it's like um like for so for example. If there was, I can't remember the philosopher who said that the, the the wine that tastes best is the wine that someone else paid for, right? And I kind of like that. It's like, like so, if you have two identical bottles of wine, the the wine that you say stool, you didn't pay for it, you stole it, is going to taste better. And there's a series I love called Peep Show, and um, this guy steals a bar of chocolate, and he's going, "Oh, it tastes great." And his friend says, "The secret ingredient is crime." Right? That's kind of the idea. Is that what what makes it taste better? But but uh, a computer wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two bottles of wine, right? Because the two bottles of wine uh, are identical, um, but one one is different because it was stolen. And so she's like, uses that famous joke, and she's like, that um. A guy goes into a coffee shop, says, could I have coffee without cream? The woman says, ah, sorry, I don't have any cream. We only have milk. Can it be coffee without milk? And, you know, she's like, makes the point that a machine will not be able to tell the difference between a coffee, a black coffee, a black coffee without cream and a black coffee without milk. Right. So <laughs> that they will all be identical. Um, the unconscious, in a sense, is there's a dimension um, of, of being human, which which can't tell the difference of that so there's me and there's me who isn't with that woman that i wish i'd been with you know <laughs> it's like so they, you know, there's there's she's not there she's not present and and so in one sense i'd be identical with or without that person but but that without is actually deeply important to understand me right you know if you you can't under this and so and it, there's lots of very interesting things you can say about that but if people are interested i think hegel and the wired brain is a, a good book on that yeah. yeah, and for us 
Jajakians being the chauvinist we are, there's always got to be a woman involved somewhere. Yes, exactly. I know. <laughs> Some <laughs> sexual thing with a woman. Yes. Uh, I know. Yeah. Um, Aura Peter, again, just to be respectful of your time. Last question. Uh, I've been thinking about your the work with paratheology and kind of uh, juxtaposing that with Buddhism, uh, because a lot of this idea of lack, desire, uh, and, you know, uh, there was a time even Lacan was deeply interested in Buddhism, perhaps even more than Zizek. Uh, just so I, I don't even know if this is something you particularly care about commenting on, but what would you say are uh, the, the, the differences between your work in your line, the way you frame, let's say, reality, and then the kind of Buddhist ontology or, or theology. Yeah, and you know, it, when it comes to say Buddhism, like I think there's probably uh, elements of Buddhism, like Zen, that actually might be you know very close to what I'm talking about. When I think of Buddhism, I'm mostly thinking, like most of us, in a sense, is Westernized Buddhism or Buddhism as it's kind of like you know presented. Stick me uh, kind of, yeah, yeah. And, and so I can talk, I can say very clearly that when it comes to kind of Buddhism as it's as as is popularly understood, it, Buddhism, you get the idea that the problem is this of desire, right? And what we want to do is free ourselves Holy from desire. desire. Uh, whereas the this kind of and um, what I call paratheology is it's not that you want to free yourself from desire. Um, it's that you kind of want to directly desire your desire you want to directly enjoy the dissatisfaction so it's not about getting rid of your dissatisfaction it's about enjoying your dissatisfaction and and also you know the pain and the pleasure that comes from that um and so an analogy um again from a, a good two comedy duo that i really like mitchell and webb but they have uh, a little sketch where this guy comes out it's a football commentator it's an advert for like this channel the sports channel and he starts talking about these football games that are going to be on at the weekend and manchester united against liverpool in a game that will obviously matter to somebody and then he goes on and he just this five minutes of like one game after another is no one will ever you know the football will continue no one will ever win nobody will ever win the football just football 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 and i and i, I love this sketch because it's like oh yeah this is why I hate sports. I'm not a sports person. And it's because no one ever wins. You know, like you have a game and then there's another game and then another game. And like, it's not a World Cup. And then, oh, somebody won the football and then we can create another game. Like, it's an eternity of just ongoing whatever. But I'm like, that actually is a beautiful analogy for how desire works is that actually the pleasure in football is when your team wins. But if your team always wins, and this happens sometimes, it happened when I was a teenager, Manchester United was winning everything. And you could tell the people who liked the the the, the team, they weren't getting even pleasure from it, like because they were just winning everything, right? You want, the pleasure is from the odd win, but the enjoyment is from being in the team through the thick and thin when they're losing and getting better. And, and then, oh, they didn't win that, maybe next year. And the fact that in a sense, there's an eternal dimension to it. And our enjoyment is, directly connected to the struggle itself that that direct enjoyment is is different from as i say how buddhism is at least presented which is a type of a, trying to detach oneself from the wheel of suffering and the wheel of pleasure um in psychoanalysis the idea is that you can't get this is drive basically so instinct it it has a direct aim you know instinct for food for mating for shelter right so as soon as the animal yeah yeah as soon as the animal does those things you know makes a makes a shelter it's done the human being gets a shelter and then wants to build an extension you know mating they don't mate we, we have foreplay we have fantasy we can you know so drive in a sense is derailed instinct it's instinct but where there's a never ending dimension and where the gambler doesn't just like the win, they like the losses, right? That's that's the that's the trick. It's like, and you know, Lacan said it, he says, if an animal eats uh for satisfaction, it's only because the animal does not know the satisfaction of not eating, right? The satisfaction of anorexia kind of says uh, there's something about human beings that can be satisfied through lacking and in very dangerous ways like with anorexia but you know an animal knew it'd be like we're talking about chat gpt or whatever large you know an animal can be um you know can enjoy food we can enjoy not eating <laughs> and 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 that that dimension is not is 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 an essential dimension of ourselves that the more we deny the more it comes up 
in destructive ways. The more we can embrace, I think, the more uh, uh, transformative and liberating and emancipatory it is. Yeah, beautiful to put, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't expecting that I had to have, have a one-on-one -on -one with you. I, I would have prepared a bit bit more if, if so, but uh, my God. Oh, no, that was a wonderful conversation. Really yeah, enjoyed I it. I'm like, I, this. Yeah. I really appreciate that. You know, your questions are brilliant. So I really appreciate getting the chance to do this. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, in fact, uh, hopefully, uh, we could organize something with Trey. Um, I, I was I was watching one of his live streams yesterday, and he said he might have COVID. So I hope he's doing all right. Maybe okay. he's just uh, unwell. So I'll just uh, email him and check up on him. But uh, again, I, I can't thank you enough. This, as as I told you, this is for me is like meeting a, a Jay Z or a Kanye. You know, so <laughs> it is it is fantastic, man. I'm a bit like starstruck. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. I love meeting you virtually. And I'm sure hopefully at some stage we'll be in the same room together. I mean, I know you're in Melbourne and I'm currently in Ireland, but um, I hope our paths cross. I do hope so. Yes, I am planning um, a few trips to Dublin. Uh, oh, and brilliant. Well, yeah, that. I'm in Belfast, two hours up the road, you know. Excellent. Yeah, because one of my, my company, we've got, a, we've got an office there and sometimes we, we, we fly through uh, to, to, to Dublin. So it should be good. Oh, yeah. brilliant. Well, you know, and try to, you know, if ever it coincides with any events that I'm doing, comes to some of that, let oh, me know. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, say Dublin and Belfast are very close. Uh, yeah. It's it's like I say, it's less than two hours. So. In fact, just to, I guess, to end the uh, episode, what are the big projects you're working on right now, Steve? Yeah, so I'm I'm looking at doing what I'm at the moment calling Church of the Contradiction. Uh, which will be because I started my work with a community in Belfast with music, art, poetry uh, in a bar in Belfast. And a lot of these ideas actually grew out of concretely incarnating them in, in, in liturgical ways. Then I spent the last 20 years mostly just speaking and writing, talking to people. So I'm now returning to wanting to set something concrete up and my desire is to show people how one way of doing it one way of introducing these ideas into ritualistic and poetic ways uh, and encourage other people to set these groups up uh, where they're uh, based it'll sometimes it'll be actually existing christian communities where pastors and leaders will bring some of these ideas into groups that exist and some people will start from scratch so that's the main thing that that I think the next decade of my life is going to be about. Um, on top of that, I'm doing more training stuff. I, I like to do retreats and festivals, and but a lot, all of that I think will be focused on helping us understand how to create, uh, I call them communions because community is a group that's based on a shared identity, shared beliefs, shared enemy, right? A communion is a group that are gathered together around a shared loss, right? The death of God, right? So a communion is a type of a meal around a lack. And uh, so in one sense, I'm going like, how do we create these communions of the contradiction, these groups of people who are not unified by necessarily a shared language, a shared identity, but unified in the sense we go, we're all lacking subjects. And we overcome our alienation by precisely seeing that alienation in the other, where we create a harbor for that that for that lack in the other, because that's what love is. Love is in a way where whenever you lust after someone, you you hope they're going to complete you in various ways. But love is where I say, I, I take the lack that is within you and I treasure it. And you take the lack that is within me and you treasure it. And we are open to that that dusting, that dimension of the other that we do not know. And if I can help create communities of people and communes of people who do that, that's what I'm, that's what I'm working on. Yeah. I can't think of a better place to end this other than the note of love. So thank you, Peter. Oh, thanks man. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. See ya.